welcome you to our symposium tonight. My name, for those who may not know, is Rob Quam. I am with Lake Wales Care Center, and we are very pleased to be one of the um, co-sponsors of this event tonight. And we have a couple of, of very, um, very informed, um, well-educated, and, um, and good communicators to come and share with us this evening on what is a very um, sensitive and difficult subject that, for those of us in small um, rural communities um, don't want to believe exists. Um, we think that's in big towns and towns with a lot of international travel, but we are going to learn some things that will open our eyes tonight and help us to be um, better neighbors and citizens for our community. Um, so we want to welcome um, our church leaders, educators, parents, and um, concerned community citizens. It is um, blessed to be here this evening and share this time um, together. If, when you came in, hopefully you got one of the folders. Um, if not, I think we'll have a couple folks. If you could raise your hand, we'll come around and hand those out um, to you. And there's some information in there um, that you can um, glean from, a little schedule about tonight. The schedule, actually, the times that are on there uh, might be a little shy of what we're actually going to spend together tonight. Um, also want to make sure that you are aware um, those that are here and those that are um, possibly watching online or will catch this later online, um, that two weeks from today, um, there is a, um, another event. It is a longer, uh, more in-depth training. Uh, we'll run from 9 to 3 on Thursday, October 28th. So if you are interested in that, there will be more information um, coming out. I'll be right back here at First Baptist Church, um, and we do thank um, the church here for hosting us. The event tonight, um, there were a number of folks that worked hard to put this together. Um, the crew was led um, by um, the um, coordinator of, of medical services at Lake Wells Care Center, Mr. Pete uh, Petrowski, and we are very pleased with his leadership for this. We also had a couple of other care center staff that were involved. Uh, we had some local um, clergy that represented our church leadership, uh, the pastor of this church, uh, Reverend Scott uh, Markley, and uh, ordained Deacon at Episcopal Church of the Good Shepherd, uh, Mr. John uh, Modis were part of that team, and then also um, the fire department. Um, the city was represented by both the fire department and the police department. Um, Deputy Chief Roy Wilkinson with uh, Lake Wells Fire Department, and him and his crew are here tonight, as well as Deputy um, Chief David Black with the Lake Wells Police Department. It's good to see their um, chief and, and um, folks here tonight as well. There are some um, table displays in the narthex, um, and maybe you saw them as you came in. If not, please um, take a look at those on the way out. Good information um, for some um, follow-up. Um, there is a um, care center table that um, highlights the Choices um, Pregnancy Care Program. Um, we are one of four pregnancy um, care, life-affirming pregnancy care agencies around the county. Uh, the rest of those agencies are also represented here tonight uh, with a Polk County for Life um, table. We also have the Lake Wells Police Department um, that is represented uh, with a booth here tonight and then um, Celebrate Recovery program up at High Point um, Church um, that is, that is um, also represented here tonight. So we appreciate um, those that are here. Our um, speakers this evening are uh, Marianne Thomas, who is um, with One More Child, um, D director of anti-trafficking, um, and also Kadian um, Parchment, who is with um, Heartland for Children, but here tonight as a subject matter expert on this subject that we'll be um, looking at this evening, human trafficking. Um, with that, I would like to welcome uh, Reverend Markley um, to the podium, um, who will further welcome us and then open us up in prayer before we get started. Thank you, Mr. Quam. Only one correction. It's a Baptist church. We don't have a narthex. It's just a hallway. Sorry. Hate to disappoint. But uh, you, can, you can access those booths in there, there nonetheless. Uh, let's, uh, I thank you for being here. Hope you have a great time. The, the women's restroom's out this way. The men's this way. Um, thank you for taking your time. I know it uh, means a lot to us to have you here because it shows you care about this uh, subject matter and cares about the citizens of our community. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for uh, these 
these speakers. We thank you for, for, for Katie Ann and for Marianne, Dr. Thomas. Lord, we thank you for um, their passion for this, this subject. Lord, we thank you for their experience. We thank you for their learning. We thank you for their knowledge, their skill and communication about it, Lord. We thank you that they are um, advocates for, for people in need, the oppressed, the exploited, um, the dehumanized uh, through this horrific a sin of human trafficking that plagues uh, so many places in our world, but even right here, plaguing our community. Lord, we pray um, as, they, as they teach us tonight, we would be open to receive all that they would instruct, that you would give us knowledge where we lack it, Lord. You would give us motivation uh, where we lack it. You give us determination to, uh, to remove this scourge from our community where we lack it, Lord. You would teach us how we might work together, joining arms, um, locking arms with, with others to, to fight against it. Lord, availing ourselves of resources that we may not have known about before this night. Lord, we thank you for Pete, his leadership for this event, and him driving it, Lord, through uh, the experiences that he had there at Choices Pregnancy Center. And so we thank you for the, that ministry and for the care center overall and all that they're doing to uh, make an impact in this community so that uh, citizens here can be cared for and, and, and the community can flourish and grow um, in good ways, Lord. And so we pray uh, that you would... Uh, Help us to be open to what you have to say to us tonight through these speakers, and we pray that you would um, help us to know how to act in a way that would uh, fight against trafficking in our community and throughout the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, everyone. All right, I'm going to try that again. Hello, everyone. Good. I'm so happy you guys are here. My name is Katie and Parchment. And I am Mary Ann Thomas. All right, so we're going to be your trainers and your speakers tonight. But we don't want to just be the ones speaking. So we're going to ask questions. We're going to engage with you guys. And if you guys have questions for us, please feel free to ask questions because we really want to see um, what you know and help to enhance that knowledge if we can. And we would love to invite you guys to come back on the 28th um, to join us for a full day of in-depth training because then we're, we're going to get into it a lot more. So before we get started, I'm going to have Marianne introduce herself and tell us a little bit about her background, and then I'll do the same and we'll go through the slides. Thank you. So my name is Marianne Thomas, um, and I work for One More Child. I am the director of anti-trafficking, and the reason that I am in this work is because that was part of my life. Um, I am a trafficking survivor, and so on my way out of that life, I jumped into school. I kept jumping into school until I had a PhD, and then I finally, they kicked me out. They said, go do something else now. And so here I am, and I've been working with children and vulnerable populations for the last decade and kind of just trying to help the next person who has a life similar to mine and then to educate people like you that we can eradicate this once and for all. Awesome. And again, my name is Katie and I work currently for Heartland for Children. Um, I got started in child welfare about 14 years ago as an investigator with the Department of Children and Families. And I was in a specialized unit called the Institutional Unit. And we did all the investigations having to do with daycares, foster homes, group homes, and human trafficking. And so we covered Polk Highlands and Hardy Counties. And then I eventually became the supervisor of that um, unit. And so I really got an opportunity to work closely with law enforcement, with service providers, with victims, with survivors, with everybody um, as we did that work. Um, and then right at about 2010 is when the Human Trafficking Task Force, per the government, was implemented. So I've been on the task force since that time. We do have one that's active and um, we welcome new people to join us if they feel a calling to do so. Um, we meet ever so often, but it's comprised of uh, people within the field who are professionals, um, law enforcement, the courts, um, regular citizens who are interested, and so that is a mandate from the state that we have a task force, or from the feds actually, and uh, we do have an active one for Polk Highlands and Hardy Counties. And so since that time, I've done a number of trainings on a lot of different subject matters, but um, I hold human trafficking near and dear to my heart because I've seen it, and I know that it's alive and well in our communities, and I've seen how it could affect our communities and our families within it. So um, that's why we're here, and we're going to go through and kind of 
give you guys the rundown of what we're going to be doing tonight and learn a couple of different de definitions. We'll go through recognizing some signs of human trafficking, um, how you could help the survivor, and how you could be an advocate, and then just understanding the trauma associated with this, the trauma associated with uh, living in survival mode at all times, and how these traffickers actually zoom in and kind of pick their victims, because this, this is a science. Okay, so what is human trafficking? Does anybody know what that definition is, what human trafficking is? Throw out whatever words you think you know. Okay, so forcing someone against their will to do something. Prostitution. Kidnapping. Anybody ever seen the movie Taken? <laughs> okay, Taken happens right here. All right? It doesn't happen in a faraway land. It happens right here in Polk County. But you guys have a couple good definitions. And there's what the Florida statute defines human trafficking as. And I'm going to walk around a little bit. Um, but you see it up there. We have some forced fraud incursion, but when we understand for sex trafficking, you're on an age of 18, they don't need to prove that. It's understood because you're under the age of 18. And so we have come into situations where we have um, victims who have been pulled in who say, well, I want to do this. This is what I want to do with my body. But you're 15. So no, you feel like you have a choice, but they don't understand that they've been kind of victimized and controlled and told that this is what's best for them and not understand that it's not. So some important acronyms to, to remember. Domestic minor sex trafficking. That means that you are a U.S. citizen or you live here. So remember Taken, how he took her away? We're talking about right here. People who identify as legal residents or U.S. citizens within the United States. That's where the domestic part of it comes in. And then CSAC is something that we like to use in our industry. It's the um, commercial, exploitation, or commercial sexual exploitation of a child. And the commercial part is we're exchanging one thing for another. It's not always cash. It could be a place to stay. It could be food. It could be shelter. It could be, I've seen Jordans. You want some Jordans? Then you got to do me this favor. Okay? And so that's where we have the commercial part of it come in. Is human smuggling the same thing as human trafficking? No. Correct. So it's really a crime against a border, right? You're illegally entering this country, and so that's what we're looking at. When we look at human trafficking, it's a crime against a person. And keep in mind, human trafficking comes in many different forms. We're going to focus on two tonight and mainly on sex trafficking, but there's different forms of human trafficking, and when you come to the full day, we'll get into those a little bit more as well. And then we have the Florida Safe Harbor Law. Mary, you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the Florida Safe Harbor Law is what established that it was the dependency track other than the delinquency track. What we mean by that is that it used to be if a child was caught in this web, that they could be penalized, that they were punished, that there used to be a term called child prostitutes. That is not a term any longer um, because a child cannot consent for sex, and so they cannot consent to sell it. Um, but now, children who find themselves in this situation, the dependency system stands up for those children, and they're given all sorts of resources to help them. They're given an attorney. They're given shelter if that's what they need. And so they don't have to stay in that world. Now we as a community are taking care of those children. Okay. And so Florida, we have a lot of human trafficking statutes that's been developed over the years, including the Safe Harbor Law. And with that Safe Harbor Law, it even gives the opportunity for safe homes to be developed. And so Marion will talk a, lot, a little bit about that as we go on throughout the night, because she is super versed in that, because that's her <laughs> daily living. But it's an opportunity for us to recognize that we can't just consider this population like every other population, right? We have to look at what has happened and how to best help those victims become survivors, become thrivers. And so we're going to kind of go through it a little bit, but um, 
like I said before, these are first-degree felonies. If you're encouraging a child to have sex, if you're branding a child, and when we talk about branding, we're talking about tattooing them or actually using some kind of brand on them, and we see traffickers do that all the time. You may see a diamond sign, you may see a rose, you may see daddy's girl, you a may crown. see some other thing that indicates that that's my property. Exactly, and we see that often, and it looks innocuous, except uh, it's not. It's, it's a way for someone to own you and to track you and to claim you publicly that this is mine. Something else that we've seen emerge are the barcode tattoos, which literally you can scan and it will tell you how much that person costs. Okay, this is reality. We've even had, heard of cases where, you know when you have the chip in your dog and to locate your, your dog? Well, now they have the chip that they're inserting in the girls so that I don't need to be on this corner as a pimp looking at you and looking for you from across the street. I could just kind of locate you all digitally this, these days. So these, these traffickers are not like people who are uneducated or who don't know the system or who don't know what's going on in technology. They're doing barcodes and they're doing all kinds of advanced things to make sure that they're keeping a track on what they deem their product, okay? And also keep in mind, these defenses could be prosecuted as RICO offenses. So meaning, let's say that we have a plaza and we have an owner who owns that plaza. He knows very well that that massage parlor is not just giving massages. But I'm gonna cl close my eyes, look this direction, ignore it because I'm getting my money, right? And they give me a little extra just to keep it going. Well, guess what? You're now profited from the sale of prostitution, so you could be prostitu prosecuted as well. And we're going after hotels that way now as well. There are attorneys who are banding together to help survivors um, sue hotels who look the other way, um, who knew what was happening and took that money and acted like they didn't know what was happening. You can now sue the hotel owners criminally and civilly. And then when we talk about the hotel and we talk about the pimps who are arranging the dates, we also have to look at what we call the Johns, right? The persons who are actually getting this, this service done. Well, now with some of these Florida statutes, we could consider them as traffickers as well. Well, I'm not the one who set it up. I'm not her pimp, but you're benefiting from it. So again, we're putting you in that category because we want to show that everybody is subject to being prosecuted or held accountable for victimizing our children and our young adults and our citizens. So let's take a closer look at the two forms of trafficking that we're gonna to discuss tonight. Um, we're gonna to talk a little bit about human trafficking as it relates to labor trafficking. Anybody ever heard of labor trafficking? No? Well, guess what? It happens, okay? It happens sometimes right in front of our faces and we don't even realize it. It happens in the, um, in the hospitality industry. It happens in the agriculture in industry. It happens in uh, service industries in the home. And am I saying that everybody who works in these industries are trafficked? Absolutely not. But it's a reality. And so we can't continue to ignore it and say, well, you know, they get paid. It's okay. Well, have you ever worked 80 hours a week and get paid $100? or sometimes get paid nothing, because that's what happens, okay? That's what happens sometimes. And so oftentimes people think that when we talk about human trafficking, labor trafficking, sex trafficking, that you're locked in a dark dungeon somewhere, and you're not allowed to leave, and you're not allowed to move around, and that's not always true. There's a case that originated in New Jersey where it was a family, husband, wife, and adult sons, all from Africa and one little village within Africa, and they would go back to their home country and recruit the young ladies from that country to come to America for a better education. And then you would be able to work and you would be able to send back home money for your family, and this is the great thing about coming with us. So of course, families are like, yes, please go work, go get your education, because now you can help us thrive and survive over in our country. Well, what they would do is bring them over here to their two-story house in New Jersey, nice house from the outside, nice house from the neighborhood, and were they going to school? Nope. Were they allowed to communicate with their families? Sure, with written letters that they had to review first, 
What did the letters have to say? We're going to school and we're, we're working and everything is good. It's just that I have to pay for my books. They weren't paying for books. They weren't getting any money at all. And so what they were having them do was actually braid hair all day. Like what I have in my hair. Okay. And so we have these girls who are working from 7 a.m. till about 2 a.m., able to walk home, able to kind of get around and do what they want to do to some degree. Because guess what? With labor trafficking, I'm going to make sure that you understand that I will go back and hurt your family. I'm going to hold on to your important documents. I'm going to threaten you with calling immigration on you. I'm going to threaten you with um, not giving you access to what you need. I'm going to threaten you physically. I'm going to emotionally take charge of you by, by making you feel in fear of your life. Don't want to tell anybody else. I'm going to isolate you and not have you around other people who may be able to help. And basically, this is what this family did. Husband, wife, son, adult son, living in a nice neighborhood for these girls. Well, guess who told on them? Any guesses? Huh? No, not the son. The son is like, huh? I didn't know what was going on. He knew. Neighbors? Nope. The girls were quiet. The house was well kept on the outside. Everything was good. It was another person who was doing dirt who they double crossed and now they wanted to get revenge. And so they went ahead and called and was like, hey, FYI, they got something going on at that house. And so the police watched that house for a couple of days and would see the girls coming and going and was like, okay. Pretty quiet, nothing's going on. Come to find out, being trafficked. These girls were sleeping on mattresses on the floor. They were only given rice and minimum food, some water, no electricity. Okay, from the outside it looks okay, but from the inside, what's going on? They were working these 18, 20 hour days and not getting paid a dime. These people made about $4 million in three years. The girls got zero. But what the girls did was they took a ledger and they wrote down every hairstyle that they did and how much that hairstyle cost. So that's how they kind of had an estimate of how much work they did and how much they did not get paid. So when we talk about labor trafficking, it could happen. It could happen in a nice neighborhood. It could happen when you're delivering something or you're visiting a neighbor and you notice that, hey, why is this kid looking a little different? Why is this kid not allowed to play with other kids? What school do you go to? I don't see you going to school. Why is this person working all day, washing clothes, and not able to really have a life of their own or speak for themselves? So keep that in mind as we talk about labor trafficking. And that kind of manipulation that she's talking about, that is exactly how the traffickers get in, whether it be labor or sex trafficking. And that sort of mind control is why many of the survivors who we know um, were able to walk around, come and go very freely, and people don't understand that, and they struggle with why didn't they leave. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Some labor trafficking that might hit a little bit closer to home. You know those door-to-door -door salesmen that come around? I had one just today show up. Um, I was working from home today, knocked right on my door. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, of all doors to knock on. <laughs> But often they're very young children, teenagers, who are telling you that they are raising money for some cause or another, some trip, some school event. The kids do not get paid. They are not raising money for whatever cause it might be. And in fact, they're being forced to go to the neighborhoods and raise this money, collect this money for a trafficker. And they get transported from neighborhoods to neighborhoods, and you can see them getting dropped off in vans. And I will tell you that just a couple months ago in the summer, the racetrack on the corner of um, 17, and like if you're going into Winter Haven, right there in um, Eagle Lake, that racetrack right there, I'm over there pumping gas, and here goes this kid. You wanna buy some candy? It's $4 for a candy bar. No, I don't wanna buy candy. What are you doing here though? Where are you from? I'm from Orlando. How did you get here? I got dropped off. By who? By my mentor. What mentor, like where is he? And so the way, and this is a tip for you guys, how do we get the information? How do we find out who these kids are and how do we intercept this and get them the help they need without seeming like we're interrogating or we're, we're, we're um, holding them hostage? Well, you're having a conversation. And so that's how I approached it. Like, oh, what are you out here selling? Okay, candy, all right, what program is this for? 
all right, that sounds cool. How old are you again? What's your name? Oh, okay. Yeah, my kids, they're about your age too. Do you go to um, Denison Middle School? Oh, you don't. What, school, what middle school do you go to? Okay, cool. So tell me a little bit about the program because I do have a son your age and I, it might be something I'm interested in getting him into. All right? Already, what do I know? His age, what school he goes to, what the program name is, who dropped him off, where he lives. And all that information is information you could pass on to law enforcement and you could pass on to the abuse hotline. And that's literally just engaging in a conversation. Okay? So with that child, that was a conversation that day. And I gave him my card. And I said, you know, you could actually, he, I think he was 15. I said, you could be a bagger at Publix. I can? Yeah. What is this program about? Well, and how long have you been out here? Well, they gave me some water earlier. Okay? Sometimes they'll give them food, but it comes out of their pay. All right? So we're going to move on from labor trafficking. And again, we'll get into it in two weeks in more detail. But let's move on to sex trafficking. Um, a common misconception, and I do it myself, I say she and, and I say girl a lot, but the facts are that out of the victims who are under the age of 18, one-third are male. And so it's very important to remember that sex trafficking victims can be male or female. Um, they come from everywhere. Like, they come from nice homes in nice neighborhoods. They come from the foster care system. Maybe they have a single parent. Maybe they have both parents. Maybe they have no parents. Um, what we know is it's about vulnerabilities, but I bet everybody in here, when you were in middle school, did you feel a little bit vulnerable? Was your self-esteem just a little bit shook <laughs> for a few years there? And that's all it takes for a trafficker to get in is something like that. Um, females with gang affiliation, that can be a very violent form of sex trafficking, and you'll hear us talk about um, what sounds like nicer terminology and what might be a nicer situation. It's all bad, but there are terms that make it sound a little bit better sometimes. Um, kids who come from abusive relationships or abuse in the home, they've just seen physical violence, they've seen substance abuse, so it doesn't have to be something that they've experienced personally, just something that they've witnessed around their person. And all of these, if you look at what these statistics are, they're talking about the ACE score, and that's something that we're going to talk about next week or two weeks, right, is the ACE score and how to see the vulnerabilities in children around you. Um, the average age of teens entering the sex trade is 12 to 14. But that means that's when we found that they were having sex, okay? The average age of grooming is eight. So they start when children are very young to train their minds to believe that their body is a commodity. Can we pause there for a second? Think about this, y'all. We're talking about an eight-year-old. We're talking about 12-year-olds. We're talking about children being groomed and kind of positioned and used in different ways that they don't even understand, okay? We're talking about kids who sometimes even younger than that because it's their own parents, their own family who have groomed them since they were younger. And so just think about the effects that that's having on that child. When we talk about A scores, we're talking about adverse childhood experiences. And the higher your score, if you score four or higher, that means that you have some toxic stress and you've experienced a lot of tough things. And it could be simple things. Parents divorced, okay, seen violence, didn't have a place to live. Those are all things that are a part of the ACE survey, and we'll talk about that more in two weeks. But those are things that the trafficker will look for, those vulnerabilities, those little holes that they can wiggle their way into. You know, the movie Taken's a great movie, and that's a type of trafficking, but most of the trafficking that we see, it is a gradual pushing of boundaries until people are doing things they never thought that they would do. So it's not like they come at you as, hey, you have to do this. It starts with something very simple, and it starts with something nice sometimes, just somebody trying to be your friend, and that's how they get you to listen to them, to believe them, to even fall in love with them, and then they can really exploit you because once they have that sort of control and they've pushed your boundaries little by little by little until suddenly your boundaries are gone. All right. And I will say I've, I've done this training at my kids' school. My kids go to All Saints, and, you know, I, I, I have a kids' version and telling them, like, hey, those people who are, like, on your video games who wants to be your friends or calling your phone or texting you or inboxing you on Snapchat and on Instagram, 
some, that's their way of getting in, developing those relationships, being your best buddy. And you would be amazed the amount of kids who came up to me afterwards and were like, Miss Parchment, but there's this number that keeps on texting me and I didn't know who it was and I didn't want to say anything. Or yeah, there is this person who's on my video game who asks me all kinds of questions sometimes. So yeah, I answer, so what? We got to educate our kids because sometimes they don't even see that there's somebody who is trying to take advantage of them being just kids. Human trafficking is modern day slavery. We have more people enslaved now than any other time in history. And we're not just talking about here in the United States, we're talking about all over the world. There is a trafficking in persons report that the federal government does where they kind of rank each country on their efforts to combat um, trafficking, on them actually doing things. And some, some countries will say, every country has denounced trafficking, but some of them are not doing anything to stop it. Okay, so when we look at the rankings, we can look at a country like Yemen, where they're like, no, no trafficking, we're against trafficking. But then on the other hand, you have a judge who is signing over ownership of a human to another human. So is that really us saying we are against trafficking? Not really. We're just culturally turning our eyes and kind of keeping it moving. Um, what about the consumers of trafficking? Do you all know the number one consumer of sex trafficking? Right here in the US, it's us. So let's look at some examples of minor sex trafficking. Again, a minor trade in sex, sexual act with an adult in exchange for a place to sleep. And we see this a lot with our kids who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, questioning, because sometimes they're displaced by their own families because, you know, I'm not going to have that in my house, or you got to move, or we can't follow my rules, or whatever else. So now it's survival mode. Now I'm trying to figure out how can I make it. Um, a father trading his underage daughter for drugs. A mother allowing her landlord to have sex with her child for rent payment. 15-year-old trading sex or acts with an adult for money. Nightclub owner providing shelter and food for minors in exchange for exotic dancing. And gangs using the girls as a form of income. I read all of those to you because I've seen every single one of those cases in Polk County. I've either investigated it or supervised it. Every single one of those cases. And so this is the reality. And I don't, we don't want to scare you but we want to wake you up to what's going on. So the three main forms, or four, go ahead. So these are the main forms of sex trafficking. Pimp controlled is pretty explanatory. We've all seen movies with the pimp. Um, he's not wearing the fancy clothes and the big hat like you saw in the 1970s movies. Um, he looks, or she, looks just like you and I. So pimps come in every form. They're not big and scary looking like in the movies. They can be your friend down the road. My first trafficker was in fact a boy on the high school football team. So a boy just one year older than me in my local high school was first selling me at the age of 15. Um, familial, we see this a lot, um, especially in different communities. We can kind of pick apart as we're going around and we work around the state different communities that have more familial, more maybe on the street trafficking, more uh, residential trafficking, where it's out calls, they go to the people's homes. So we see it in different communities. Survival sex, that is what Kadian was just saying. Um, you're on the streets, you're homeless, you're hungry, you need to eat. You need a place to stay, it's cold, it's raining. You do what you have to do to survive out there. And then finally, the gang controlled, and this is a very violent form. Um, these girls and boys really get tortured. Yeah. And I'm glad she pointed out, Marianne pointed out, that the pimps can be the girls too, yeah. right? A lot of times there's a hierarchy. So you may see a pimp, and then we have somebody what's called the bottom, who is kind of like HR, who works under the pimp, who does the recruiting and stuff. But sometimes the pimp could be that 16-year-old girl in your kid's class. It could be auntie down the street. It could be mom. It could be that neighbor. And so don't dismiss it as, oh, well, that's a nice lady down the street. Because unfortunately, sometimes they, they, they do it as well. And Katie, and use the term recruiter, and we see that often where girls will lure other girls in. It's a survival tactic as well. If I can get my friend Katie Ann to do an act I don't want to do, 
I don't have to do that act anymore. And so it's a survival way of, of being in that world, but it's also a punishable way of being in that world. Mm -hmm. So let's look at a couple profiles of a pimp, right? Because we have different ways in which we kind of bring people in. So we have Mr. Romeo. That's Mr. Baby, 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 I love you so much. I'm your boyfriend. I'm the only one who cares about you. Tell me everything. I'm going to buy you food. I'm going to get you what you want. I'm your everybody. Who's messing with you? I, I'll go beat them up. This is the guy or the girl who is going to make sure that you turn to them for everything. I love you. You love me. We're number one together. Then we have Mr. Gorilla Pimp. This is a pimp who is literally going to come in and beat you down up front to let you know that I am in control. Okay? We've seen cases like that. There is no baby, baby, baby stage. There is this power and control up front. Um, but don't get it twisted because one is interchangeable with the other one. Mr. Romeo, don't get too comfortable and don't get too chatty because I'm going to show you that I'm still in charge. So even though I'm nice to you, I'm going to control you in one way or another. And then who fits into these categories? Like Marianne said earlier, anyone. I have seen a pimp who was a middle-aged white man who lived in Gainesville, who owned his own real estate company and who lived in a upper-class neighborhood, but had three girls in his house locked up. Okay? It could be anyone. So unfortunately, Hollywood has taught our kids that the pimps are the ones with the pimp walk and the pink pat and the pinky and all of that. But in reality, we have to let our kids know that could be anyone. And they just have to be aware. And when she was talking about how those two types of pimps can be interchangeable, that's the cycle of abuse, too, where it's a honeymoon for a little bit. I love you, I love you, I love you. And now you've disappointed me and I'm angry with you. And we go through this whole cycle where, and then we go back to the honeymoon again. Um, and that is how they control as well. As, as long as you can keep your victim twisted up in the head, you can get them to do anything you want them to do. From the mind of a pimp, and this is what a pimp actually said. Once you step into that world, which is the world, um, you have given up who you are for what I want you to be. You like wearing your hair long and blonde? Well, that's nice. Now you're going to start wearing your hair short and red. You like going to bed at a certain time? That's not happening. Oh, you like taking showers every day? That's definitely not happening. Because you have entered my world, and now you're going to follow my rules. So we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about the recruitment and grooming stages of it. And I think this is where we... Okay. And we have a video that we're going to show. Um, so they're going to play it in a second. But just as, as you're listening to this video and watching it, they're going to kind of go through, and this is like a pimp talking to a, a victim um, who finally becomes a survivor. And some of it could be a little bit graphic, but understand that there is a process associated with this. There is that buy-in, there is that manipulation, and then there's that payback stage. So watch the video and listen to what they're saying, and then you'll get a little bit of understanding about all the different stages. Can y'all play it from up there? You're beautiful. I didn't mean to come off cheesy or needy, but noticing you was easy. Believe me, I tried to hold my tongue and hide and not tell you what others fail to. And that's, you're beautiful. So royal. Wish I could be planted in the same soil as you so we can grow together instead of me coming off so damn brand new. I hope my approach is refreshing. I mean, you somebody's blessing, someone's hope. I mean, damn, you so dope, like for real. You laughing. <laughs> and I know in the back of your mind, you're like, is this really happening? Like, are you serious? And I seek to discover you, not just because I'm curious, but I want to understand what you look for in a man and try my best to become it. He's smiling again. You should do that more often. I mean, it's amazing to see a hard shell begin to soften. R.I.P. to the anger that now lives in the coffin. And hello to the beauty that appears on your heart when I say the words, you're beautiful. But even in your smile, I could tell you feeling down. Like you're not happy where you are and the people who are around. 
and I could tell you have goals and I'll be pleased to help you reach them. And I can see your past demons and if you need help to beat them, just give me a call. They're probably telling you right now, don't believe them. But if you take that risk, I promise you this. Do you like nice things? Yeah. Let's get it. And I appreciate you for being woman enough to admit it. Let's go into business. Be my partner. You'd be untouchable with me as your armor. Let's go to war together and get this money. And I'll shield you from anything that won't help to build you. You down? I'm in. Look at you now. You look so alive. It's crazy how money can change you. Take a beautiful picture and frame you. To be seen by all, we'll have the power. We'll never fall, this world is ours. Me and you do or die. You did good this week. Give me a high five. Where did all your beauty go? I need you to find it. You're thinking too far into the future and I need you to rewind it just a little to be reminded that we're a team. And I know you never dreamed of this as a girl, but, but there, there are grown, grown women who would love to live in your world. So put, put that smile back on your face. And remember, you're beautiful. Don't let them lie to you, make you feel like what you're doing is unusual. Women have sex all the time and receive heartbreak in return. You get to have power, so don't you dare feel ashamed of the money you earn. Even wives have sex with one man in exchange for security of a home. Plus, you are pure before. You were doing this all along. And now, don't tear yourself down for making a living today. Offer something for free you are already giving away. You make me feel like a product. You were so starstruck when we met. Now. Everything I do makes you upset. I'm tired of the abuse and neglect. You look at me like an object and won't acknowledge this, introducing me to bad people and filling me up with broken promises. Remember, I'll help you. Every, Every step, step of, of the, the way, way I'll, I'll guide, guide you. you. I'll mold you. Where, Where were, were you? you? Don't, Don't lie, lie to me. me. Oh, I'm talking, talking to you. you. Eye, eye contact. contact. Eye contact. Don't, Don't you know you're tied, tied to me forever? forever? I will tighten this noose around your neck if you ever decide to get clever. I own you. I built you. There's plenty of days I could have killed you, but I spared your life and released my hands from that knife. So don't make me grip it again. And don't you ever confuse me for being your friend. I created you, took you from the hands of people who hated you, looked at you as a piece of ass, and I made you feel good about yourself, and I made you laugh. You can't leave. I'll tell everyone about your past. Plus, you in debt to me and I will stop at nothing to get my cash. Go, Go through, through loved ones and family members just, just to, to make, make you remember who you are. I'm your God, so worship me and ask for forgiveness of your sins. And you better hope I give you mercy because if you ever do this again, I will use your body as an ashtray, get high and look at you and laugh. I own you. I will forever be the face you come home to. I became a follower of darkness, feeling unworthy of light. I became powerless to his artistry and unable to fight. I was living a slow death. And after numerous deep breaths and being tired of the stress, I found the will to escape on my own. No manipulation, no more uncomfortable situations, no more being forced to please their desires, no more being touched by hurtful people, no more. I am valuable. I am loved beyond measure. I am priceless. I am free. I am worth more than rubies and pearls. I am a lovely melody. I am a gorgeous harmony. I am a light worth seeing and I am an amazing human being. I'm beautiful. And so I like this video a lot because it really tells us 
the story of how he made her depend on her, told her she was beautiful. And again, their look for that vulnerability, when no one's ever told me I was beautiful before, and all he tells me is that I'm beautiful. I love him. And then it becomes the manipulation, it becomes the payback, it becomes the power and control. It becomes the separation of family. I took you away from the people who didn't even care about you. They're never going to want you again. You're broken. No one loves you. And so it also tells the story of her strength, how she realizes that I'm worthy. But some of our girls don't have that. Some of the girls, our girls don't get that. And that's why it's important for people in the community like you guys to connect, to be there for other children, to be there for young adults who may be subjected to this. Absolutely. And I think that showed a very common form of the Romeo pimp, too, that that's what they do. Um, I had a trafficker who I was a homeless kid um, after my first trafficking uh, situation. And so I was a homeless teenager out in the streets. And a guy came up to me. He was just a couple of years older. He kind of knew who I was. He knew me from the community. He um, told me I was beautiful. He told me he loved me. And he gave me a place to live. And then I was grateful. And that's where it started, is I was grateful. And so when he started pushing my boundaries, and when he started becoming abusive, I took it. And I didn't say a word. And I kept it to myself. And then when it turned into him selling me, I still took it. And I didn't say a word. And I didn't tell anybody. And I was out in the community. And I was out where you would have seen me. I wasn't hidden away. I was going to church. I was going to places that you would have seen me. And I wasn't saying a word. And that was all because of the control he had over my mind, where he played that game. I love you, I love you, I love you. Now you've disappointed me, and you have to try harder to please me. Yeah. And so as you're kind of thinking and engaging and interacting with some of these young people, then what are some signs that you look, look out for? You're on social media, very sexually explicit um, photos, uh, poses, attire, um, them being able to afford things that they never were able to afford before, especially we see that it's some of our kids who are in foster care. We know you can't afford that $1,300 um, iPhone or $300 hair or your nails being done every other day because we know what kind of money you get because we're the ones who take care of you. Um, so those are signs that you look out for. Are they using the terminology in the life. If a kid is saying, oh, that's my bottom, that's my sister wife, uh, that's my daddy, those are red flags because why are you using those terms? You're not in the life, why are we using these terms? If they're going to doctors or y'all are in the medical field and you're noticing this child is always coming in with some kind of um, STD or physical abuse indicators on them, or other indicators that may be a red flag that what is going on here? I need to dig a little deeper. And the number one symptom that we see in, in childhood sexual abuse in general is undiagnosed stomach issues. Mm -hmm. So if you see a kid that's having all kinds of stomach issues over and over and over and nobody can pinpoint it down to something, check for further uh, flags there. Okay. Truancy is another big thing, always running away. And there is a human trafficking tool that's used with the department and with the Depart um, Department of Juvenile Justice, so DJJ, and one or the two, we have to um, administer that tool. But we look for these indicators. Are they frequent runaways? Are they living in homes where they've been removed before? What is, there's a whole list and a whole bunch of questions and things that you have to go through, and you're fully aware of this tool. But those are things that we want to look at because very quickly, if a child runs away, a trafficker is on their tail. They're ready to grab them. They're really ready to really kind of take advantage of them and bring them into their life. And these kids are, are naive, even though they've had hard lives. They will still get in a car with a stranger. They will still walk off with somebody they don't know. They will still walk up and go smoke weed with a stranger and not even think twice that this person could have bad intentions. Yeah. And I've done this training for the kids who are in delinquent courts at the Bartow Courthouse. And I've had kids come in there, this is dumb, I'm not doing this, and going off and going off. But then they don't realize that a trafficker could be sitting in that same courthouse, listening, and take advantage of their attitude by saying, man, this is dumb, come smoke with me. 
And before you know it, you're smoking with them, you're hanging out with them, and then you're payback. You got to do this for me. Okay? I included this slide just so you guys get a little bit of an idea of some of the numbers and the growth that's coming to the Department of Children and Families. In 2009, DCF added the human trafficking maltreatment to the maltreatment index. So somebody could call the abuse hotline. This is the only maltreatment that the perpetrator does not have to be a caregiver. Okay, and, but look at the numbers. And this could be because of education, it could be because of awareness, and it could be because this is a lucrative industry. But in 2009, with unique IDs, we had 43 cases called into the abuse hotline. Um, total reports received by the hotline for 2009 was still the 43. And so it may come in as human trafficking, and it may not come in as human trafficking, but at, during the course of the investigation, that maltreatment is added. So that's the difference between unique ID, because it, it came in as that. But then we scroll all the way down to 2019, um, where we have over 2,000 cases that's called in throughout the state of Florida. But those are the cases that are calling, having to do with minors, and the cases are actually called in. We know that there's a lot of cases that cannot be called into the abuse hotline for um, adults because they're adults or there may be cases that are not called in at all because it's our family secret or we'll handle it ourselves or I don't feel comfortable enough to identify as such. Just another little graphic, the hot spots and think about where we are guys. We are in the central region so what do we have close by in this area? If we think about just central Florida. Huh? We have Disney World, so people come and visit the airs, and so we have a lot of tourism traffic in. What else? We have sports. What else do we have that runs through Florida? Conventions. We have I-4. We have 95. We have the Turnpike. We have a centralized location in central Florida. So we had a case with a pimp called Big Mike. I mean, can we get pimpy enough with the name? But he set up shop in Lakeland because for him it was easy. He had a, a guy call him from Miami, I need some girls. I could get them there in a couple hours. Same weekend he had a guy call him in Jacksonville, I need some girls. He get them there in a couple hours. In this centralized location you could hit the whole state pretty easily. If he was in the panhandle and they called from Miami asking for girls, eh, can't get there in time. But then Miami itself has its own little cluster of stuff. You see down here? What do we have in Miami? We have the ports, right? We have uh, easy access to other countries. Uh, we have a vast um, a variety of people who are there as tourists. No one's going to question me if I'm going to the beach in Miami, not knowing that I'm flying in to have sex with a minor. I'm on vacation. It's the Sunshine State. And so this is why we're a hot spot. We're number three in the country. And so one of the things that we have to encourage is our survivors to have a voice, to get to a point where they can feel like they are heard and help them to kind of move on and, 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 and thrive in right. some regards. And so that, that is why I do what I do. Um, when I was being trafficked, there wasn't even the term human trafficking. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know what it looked like. It wasn't a thing yet. Um, I was blamed a lot, and I took a lot of self-blame for the things that I went through. I was told that I was making those choices. I believed I was making those choices. And so it takes a lot to change that mind frame that I chose this life and I chose, I used to say I chose bad boyfriends and bad husbands. Um, and now it took a lot of time and a lot of healing for me to really understand what my life looked like. But I was sitting in a training somewhat like this, watching them talk about human trafficking, watching them talk about what the different signs of human trafficking are. And in my head, I was um, a clinician at the time, I had my master's degree, and I was watching this training and um, checking off the boxes in my head of all the things that they said were human trafficking. And it hit me that that was me, that that had been my life, that that's what that was. And so I had to first learn, A, how to accept the word victim. I did not take that one easily. I don't like thinking I've been tricked. <laughs> and I think I'm pretty tough and strong. 
And so for me to wrap my head around that, that someone had manipulated me to that point, that I really was confused about what I even wanted to do. When Kadian was talking about changing the way you look, my hair's been long, short, colored, changed, get bigger, get smaller, all of those things. Someone controlled every aspect of my life. Someone controlled what I wore. In my head still today, I will put on something and think for a second, oh, you can't wear that, and then have to remind myself, yes, I can. I can wear what I want now. And that's part of what happens to us is we get so stifled. We are so beat down mentally, even if it's not physically. But a lot of times it's physically too. We are so beaten down that we don't have a voice anymore. We don't know how to stand up for ourselves. We don't know how to say this isn't okay. And so that's what I do now is I go around and I spread awareness so that maybe somebody even sitting out there says to me later, hey, this happened to me too. This isn't okay. How do I start my healing journey? And that's what I want to equip communities to do is how to recognize victims, how to recognize the vulnerabilities so that we don't have to go through this. Because if you can catch little Marianne before all this happened to her, that's a whole lot better deal than waiting until I've already been in it for 17 years and then finding me and helping me. And that's exactly what happened is I stayed in the life for 17 years of my life. I didn't get out until I was 31 years old. And the first place I went was to school. And that's because one person who didn't even know what was happening all of the way just knew that I was in a bad situation at home, knew that I was being beat by my husband, who was my trafficker. I married two traffickers. Um, beat by my husband, forced to work in the clubs, forced to sell myself. And somebody said, boy, this doesn't look right. This isn't OK. And said to me over and over and over, you can do something different with your life. You don't have to do this. There is something else for you. And convinced me to go to college. I had a GED. I did not think you were allowed to go to college with a GED. I didn't even know. And so um, I was scared. And that's part of it, too, is we lose a lot of the life skills that most of you got growing up. Because while you're being sold, no one's teaching you how to fill out a resume. No one's telling you where to pay your electric bill. No one's telling you those things that people know. No one tells you how to wash dishes. You know, What do you do when you, you know, spill honey on the floor? How do you clean it? What happens if there's a stove fire? All those things. We aren't taught those skills. And so when we come to you and we're grown now, or even as teenagers or adolescents, when we come to you and we don't have those skills, People tend to not want to deal with us because we're problems to you now, because we have so little skills that we're irritating, that you're bothered by why don't we know how to do this. And so this person knew my fear of going into the school and didn't just say, you should go to school. They literally walked me to the school, walked me to the registration office, walked me to my first class that day, and did all of those steps because that's what it takes. We need someone to show us how to walk out of that life. You can't just tell us that's not enough. We can't hear you over the voice of our trafficker in our head. And so you have to physically walk us through it. And that's what brings us here today. That's why I'm able to do this is because someone was willing to do that for me. And I'm going to do it for the next person too. Absolutely. Thank you. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about what is a child worth? How much do you guys think this industry brings in a year? Give me some guesses. Millions, you said? OK. Billions. All right? So we got 40 million people around the world who are trafficked right now. And this yields an estimated 150 billion, would it be? That's what it be, guys. A year in profits. Look at what it was in 2004, 9 to 12. We're in 2021. How much it has grown? OK, so do, do you think the traffickers want to stop this? Absolutely not. When we think about uh, drug trafficking and arms trafficking, it's a little bit more risky. So think about this. Marianne and I are walking through the airport, right? I had her swallow some bags of drugs. So she has the balloons in her stomach, and we're coming to TSA, and she's sweating bullets. Because she knows she has to go through that, that, that reader thing. She has to get scanned. She, the dogs might be walking around. And she is scared. I'm a little nervous too, but I'm telling her, keep your cool. Because we need these drugs to get to the next location. But it's a little nerve-wracking. 
All right? So think about Marianne and I are now walking through the airport, and I'm her trafficker. And she, we're walking, and she looks sad, but our mom just died. So that's why she looks sad. And it's okay. She doesn't speak a lot because she's super shy. All right? So we're walking through the airport. Am I worried about going through TSA? No. <laughs> I don't worry about that. My product goes right through with no problem. And the other part of that is if I am going to sell you a bag of drugs, I can only sell it to you one time. Once I sell you that bag of whatever, you've bought it, you consumed it, it's gone forever. You can sell the human body over and over and over again. You can sell it 10 to 15 times a day. It's just very lucrative if not more. And we've seen cases where they've had to do even more than that. And so what do you think they're turning to? These gangs, they know that there's money in trafficking. And so they're turning to this. They are, they're utilizing this as their means of income. And so uh, this is why it's become such a lucrative industry to begin with. But don't worry, those penalties are getting steep. And they're making sure that they kind of look at it as felonies in a lot of instances. So if you see something, say something. It could save a life. If you see something, like Marianne said, it took one person to realize that something wasn't right. They didn't know exactly what, but it was the, the, the life-changing difference for her, right? It was that one person who said, there is more. You are worthy. Because the traffickers have beat them down many, many times. No one wants you. You can't go back home. You're garbage anyway. Whatever they may say to continue to manipulate and exert that power and control, they will do. But it may take that one person to say, you are worthy. I tell every kid I interact with in the child welfare system, you are not your current situation or circumstances. Okay? You are worthy of more. And we have to speak that language. We have to go with that um, strength base, that trauma-informed care, that understanding that some of our behaviors are not because we're bad kids, it's because We've come through bad things, okay? So it's not why you're acting like that. It's what happened to you. So how can you help? Again, if helping is by understanding. Do you understand what trauma is? Do you understand what some triggers might be? Do you understand that if a trafficker made you um, eat only hot dogs, for six weeks that the smell or the sight of a hot dog might be a trigger to you. So if you're going to a barbecue or you're hosting something, then you may need to understand that, hey, this kid or this young adult, let's not have, let's not have hot dogs here, okay? We've had other ab abuse reports where it's, I'm gonna wash out your mouth with dishwashing soap. And so the mere smell of the dishwashing soap is a trigger. So we try to inform the caregivers, we try to inform the foster parents that, hey, I know you have your chart list and you have all the chores that everybody has to do but washing dishes is not for this kid because I'm gonna make sure I'm disruptive I show my trauma before I have to experience relive it, that trauma of smelling that soap again so it's my night to wash the dishes you better believe the day before or a couple hours before I'm gonna be super disruptive because I don't want to experience it again but if we don't understand trauma and we don't understand how it manifests itself in behaviors and everybody daily life, then we won't be able to move forward with help in this community. When speaking with survivors, engagement skills are key. It's about relationship. I'm not going to tell you what's happening to me if I don't trust you. And I already don't trust you. I've been taught to not trust anybody outside of my trafficker. And so in order to get to me, in order to get me to understand that you are a safe person, you have to build a relationship with me. You cannot be fake with, with victims of human trafficking because they will smell it a mile away. You must be your authentic self, whatever that is, and just build that relationship because that is what will enable that child or that adult to trust you. Right. So think about it. 600,000 to 800,000 people are trafficked internationally across borders each year. About 70% of them are female and 50% are children. So just think about the large number. And we may say, well, we live in this community. I don't really see anything like that. You just never know. It could be you stopping at the rest stop. It could be you going to a sport events. That's another big time where traffickers take advantage. NFL experience, Super Bowl, all those times is when traffickers are like, this is big money time for us. So it could be you stopping in the Cracker Barrel to have lunch on your way somewhere else and you interact with a kid in the bathroom 
or we had one um, instance where there was a flight attendant who noticed that there was a gentleman who was well dressed, kind of put together really well, and a young lady with him that just looks disheveled. She wasn't allowed to make eye contact. She wasn't allowed to speak for herself. She was sitting in this chair beside him just looking uncertain. And so she took note of it because she sat through one of these trainings like you guys did and said something isn't right. And so even though she was trying to get her attention in flight, she couldn't. So she decided, you know what, I'm going to try something else. So she had one of the other air fly, um, flight attendant come over, offer the guy a complimentary drink, and he engaged with him, and then she motioned to the young lady, go to the bathroom. In the bathroom, she had already left a note, are you okay, are you safe, yes or no, and left a pencil in there, and she answered no. Now, they were on a flight to an international de destination. Is there a possibility that we would never see that kid again? Okay, but her instance um, kicked in. She remembered some of the indicators, not being able to speak for herself, not being able to make eye contact, looking disheveled. The two doesn't look like they match or they know each other. There was some power and control aspects to that. And she said, I'm going to ask just to see. And she was right. She saved her life. And that was recent, guys. Um, being a mentor... That is exactly what we need. Just like my friend did for me in, in walking me out. The one thing that, that nobody did tell me as I was leaving that life is how much I would need other people. Mm. And so I didn't gain some of the skills that I have now until much later after my trafficking experience because I just didn't know. I'd never asked for help before. I didn't even know people were supposed to ask for help. And I really thought you were weak if you asked for help. And so a lot of trafficking survivors feel the same way. They feel, you know, I've survived this on my own without you all this time. I'm going to keep figuring it out. And so it's very important for community members to step up and be a mentor wherever you can. If you can help out with um, helping a kid do their taxes for the first time when they get their first job, that would be amazing. If you have an art skill and you want to share it with trafficking survivors, that would be awesome. Whatever you have, teach us how to change a tire. That is one thing I can do. But teach us how to do something that we don't know how to do because we've missed so many life skills while we were in the life. And we need people who are safe, who are going to come to us and show us those things that we didn't get to learn. Okay. Also, when interacting and how you could help is by not reacting verbally or physically in a manner that you are like disgusted. If, 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 if someone, a child or an adult, feels like they have the, the guts and the, the, um, the um, what am I looking for, like the courage to disclose to you what's been going on to them, then listen non-judgmentally. You have to, because when you start, I'm like, oh, what? oh my God. I don't want to talk to you anymore because already I feel like you're judging me, okay? We've come across kids who use terms that you might clutch your pearls with. You, you said what? You had to do what? Just listen because that might be that child's only time to set, tell you what's going on. But we have to be mindful of our own selves and our own reactions. And it's okay to have those minimal encouragers to show that concern in your face, to nod, to say, oh my, I have no words. And you saying, I have no words, it's okay. Okay? I know we're all experts in lives because we're adults, but sometimes it's okay to say, I don't know, but let me see if I could get you some help. And it's an honor if someone shares their story with you. That's saying that they feel safe with you. That's saying that they feel like you can, you can do something to help them. They're not just sharing it just to share. And so that's really important that you honor that, that space. Um, it's funny that this is in, in the slide because this is something I say at the beginning of every speech usually. I say, I'm going to tell you some horrible things about my life. You don't get to make faces at me. You don't get to have a stronger emotional reaction than I do to my life. And please don't come hug me afterwards. <laughs> and yet without fail, after speeches, people will come up and they will sob on me and hug me and tell me how you know, they feel about my trauma. Well, that's not trauma-informed, and that's not helpful to me. That's something that you're reacting to, and that's great, but you need to take it somewhere away from a survivor because that's not honoring to us and our story if you're having an emotional reaction to our actual reality. Does everybody remember exactly what they ate last week for lunch on Tuesday? <laughs> 
Probably not, right? So I want you to keep this in mind also. When we're engaging with survivors or victims in that moment, and we're trying to get the information and kind of see what the history is, there may be some stories that just doesn't fit all the way through because that's the brain trying to process everything. So they may say, well, no, it was eight months ago. But then you know, well, eight months ago you were living in, in Pasco, you weren't over here. But it, it's the trauma. It's them trying to put it all in pieces. So be mindful of not challenging them because their brain, just like yours, can't remember every single detail at every single moment and put trauma on top of that. You think it's easy? It's not. And so keep that in mind too when you're interacting that we also don't want to victim blame. Well, if you don't run away, this wouldn't have happened. If you didn't do drugs, this wouldn't have happened. If you didn't wear that outfit, this wouldn't have mm. happened. If you didn't hang out with that crowd, this wouldn't have happened. Well, I told you to go to school and listen, but you didn't. Right? Is that helpful? It's not helpful. It's happened. Let's move on. However it got there, there's no excuse. I could wear the shortest skirt I want to wear. That's no excuse for somebody to victimize me. There's no excuse for somebody to take advantage. There's no excuse for somebody to groom and then take advantage of that young man or woman. Because again, we like to say she and her, but it could be boys too. And we've seen it happen with our young men. We've seen them be victimized. We've seen them be groomed online and brought to a place and have to work off whatever debt they have, have to model, have to sleep, have to with different women and men. We've seen it happen. And so just be mindful that we don't want to victim blame and that we want to make sure that we're listening non-judgmentally and that we're coming from a place of being trauma-informed. Talk about, a little, about what y'all do. Yeah, the last little bit of that slide said something. You don't have to go back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> says about our coping mechanisms, and this is about our symptoms that you're going to see. So when we're talking about it clinically, you're going to see us come with a lot of symptoms. We're also going to come with a lot of diagnoses. Um, one of the things I did when I was going to school because I didn't know what else to do with my life was I ended up with a degree in counseling and a PhD in psychology. Um, and so I love learning about how my brain worked in order to understand how to heal myself is kind of how I went through things. And so knowing the symptoms, when you're looking at the symptoms, our kids are going to come to you with diagnoses like bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety. We see borderline personality disorder diagnosed in children under 18, which you really aren't supposed to do. You're supposed to be over 18 for that. They come with PTSD. They come with all of these diagnoses, um, anxiety. And yes, all of that is real. If you had been tortured and victimized for years of your life, would you be anxious? Probably. <laughs> would you be depressed? Yeah, probably. Would you have mood swings? Yeah, that all sounds like that would be a normal reaction to a horrible life, right? And what we know now is that we can't separate those diagnoses out into saying those different parts of the diagnosis. The one diagnosis should be complex trauma, because that's what we're looking at. Because of the complex trauma, meaning that you had traumatic situations repeatedly for a long period of time. Lots of us have trauma in our life with a little t, right? That capital T trauma is what I'm talking about. When a child has been victimized for years of their life, for 17 years of their life, okay? That is the kind of complex trauma I'm talking about. It is very natural that we are going to come at you with some diagnoses. And so understanding that all of that that you're seeing, yes, are things like anxiety and depression and bipolar, but it's all because of trauma. And once we treat the trauma, we can really see all of those things lessen. The other symptoms that we come to you with are ones you really don't like, and those are our behavioral symptoms. Um, often we're angry. That also makes sense. We have every right to be angry. However, nice well-meaning society members like yourself really don't like it when we scream at you, yell at you, cuss at you, and push you away from us. But that's exactly what you're going to see from us because we are angry and we have the right to be angry. What we need are people who are going to teach us what to do with that anger because it's not helpful for us. It only hurts us inside. And so we have to learn how to take those feelings and identify them as what they really are, hurt, sadness, 
uh, loneliness, whatever it might be, we recognize those new emotions that maybe we never had before or never recognized before, and we're able to learn coping skills. Our coping skills are not so great for a lot of reasons. Um, and often, the coping skills that we have and that we actually enjoy that we think helps, you all don't like. And it's things like self-harm, cutting, hurting ourselves in some way. People don't like that because it doesn't look nice to society. It's not a healthy coping skill, but it is a coping skill. It does make us feel better in the moment, but people are very upset by that. And so a lot of people want to Baker Act us just because we cut. We don't need to be Baker Acted. Cutting is about feeling a pain. It's about letting the pain out. Suicide is about ending the pain. So those are two very different feelings, even though it's a very scary thing if you know someone who is cutting. We have lots of coping skills that you also don't like. Um, like we take extreme forms of control over things. <laughs> um, uh, I like to joke with my, my friends and family about me having OCD. I really have to have control of some things in my life. I am a checkbox kind of girl. If I can list something off and check it off, it is my happy day. But it can be very annoying to those people around me because I'm trying to control so much. You'll see a lot of eating disorders with us. That goes back to that need for control, that I can't control what's happening to my body. I sure can control what goes into my body. And so we take those forms of control wherever we can. And that's a skill that we have to unlearn. And when we already don't know how to ask for help and we're used to taking care of ourselves and we have this control issue, it makes it very difficult for people to reach us. And that's why you have to be so consistent and persistent with how you attend to us. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's a lot, and we're giving you a lot of information tonight. Um, but our hope is that you will take this information and go talk to your kids. Help them to understand um, that, you know, this is something that's real. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your nieces and nephews, talk to somebody and educate them about human trafficking in our community and some of the, the things that come along with that. And it's okay, like, you're, if you're a parent, parent. It's okay, do a random phone check, okay? I have like 360 on my teenagers' phones, not because I don't trust them, I don't trust other people, especially in the field that I'm in. And so I have a daughter in college in Miami, so yes, I'm still keeping a little track and seeing if you're okay, you made it home, you need to be on the phone with us when you're walking, and all those kind of things. Because guess what? It just takes somebody else who has bad intentions to really affect somebody's life in a very negative way. And so um, keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that some of our victims also will gravitate right back to that trafficker. And that's almost like that Stockholm Syndrome. And so it's not that time for you to say, well, you want to go back? What's wrong with you? Hello, it's trauma. It's someone who has groomed them. It's somebody who has conditioned their mind to think that they are their everything. And so they're going to gravitate to what they know and what they love. And we see that even with our kids who are being physically abused by their parents or something else that's been very traumatic or you would never return. That's who they know and love. And so that's who they want to return to. So just keep those things in mind as we close, and we're going to get into questions and answers in the last couple minutes that we have. And Marion, I don't know if you had anything else you want to close I just with. wanted to add one little bit to that. We have a saying in the life, the hell you know is better than the hell you don't know. Mm -hmm. So when you're wondering why we go back, that's it. I know what this trafficker is going to do. I know what's going to make him hit me. I know what nights he's going to turn me out. I know where he's going to turn me out. That's a lot better than me hitting the streets and not knowing what's going to happen next. And so just keep that in mind that we return to the familiar, like most of us do. Yeah. So any questions or any thoughts as we kind of wrap up? Um, do we work with them? Not, we don't actually work with them. So I provide services locally in Florida. We have units that go out that work with boys and girls ages 10 to 24 in the community, wherever they might live, um, or if they're in the DJJ system or foster care, we go to them. We also have a safe home for minor girls where up to six girls at a time, that's it, just six, can come and live with us for six to nine months and get the healing that they need. 
And like I've done trainers with Shared Hope International, mm -hmm. so I've been one of their tra trainers at their conference. And so their international organization, Polaris, they have their international arms. But what we do is, is really mainly local and in our community kind of outreach um, to the people who we interact with and live with every day. But there are a, a ton of great organizations out there. If you want to do that international outreach that you could connect with online and see what's available and how you could um, get involved. Any other questions? Well, it depends on what you're seeing. So if you see a child in danger or anyone in danger, please call 911, um, start there. Um, but if you see a child, or if you know of a child, they go to school with your child, you see them at the, you know, at the ballpark every week, and you suspect trafficking, first you want as much details as why you suspect it. What are you seeing that makes you think it? You can always call for children the Florida Abuse Hotline, which is 896 Abuse, and they have operators who are trained in human trafficking to ask the right questions and help you along that. Also, the national hotline is up there. It's 888-3737-888, and that's for any age and any state. So anywhere in the nation, if you suspect trafficking, you can make that phone call, and they will have people come out and investigate it, people who are trained to investigate it. And let me say this also, when we talk about calling the hotlines, if you're engaging with someone and they're telling you their story and they're using terminology that is specific to their experience, use the same ter terminology when you're calling the abuse hotline. It connects the dots for them and for law enforcement. Because if, if, you're, if they're saying, oh, well, you know, he calls himself Teddy Man or, you know, he calls his private parts that and you want to pretty it up and say, well, they, you know, use the, pro the proper terminology. Don't, because law enforcement wants to know, well, that's the third kid that called in using that same terminology for that body part. There's a connection here. And those might be the little details that help connect the dots to get this trafficker off the streets. The other thing that you guys all got when you walked in was that resource guide. Um, Pete and has been very diligent about putting this together and putting a ton of resources in there for you. Everything from online resources that you could help with, have with your kids to help kind of help monitor them and their interactions with other people to outreach services from one, uh, one more child. Um, resources from Heartland for Children, um, Sela Freedom, and a lot of different organizations that could help. And so utilize that, use it, and, and refer back to it, and share it with someone else, because there is a ton of information that you could use in there, and, um, and something that might actually help somebody in a big, big way. Any other questions? Right. So like I was saying before with the traveling sales crews, engage in a conversation, right? Ask those questions in a, in a way that's not threatening. And if you feel safe enough, write down the license plate number. Are we saying to now become a deputy and start chasing people? And No, don't do that don't because do that. safety is number one, right? We don't <laughs> need you trying to do a citizen's arrest. But we, if you are able to gather information about that kid who you're interacting with at the gas station to be able to call the abuse hotline and report it or to be able to call law enforcement and report it, then they need as much information as possible. And I will say one of the first cases I got of human trafficking was exactly that. It was a traveling sales crew, kids in a Target wall, um, parking lot in Lakeland, and, the, and he was from Orlando. And this was back in the day, so, you know, the training wasn't there all the way for law enforcement, and they had gotten dropped off in a creepy white van that was the tinted windows down the street, and kind of there for hours selling candy in the parking lot. And when the case was called in, law enforcement was called, and the kid was released to the trafficker because mom said, oh, no, it's okay. Well, we know mom could have been the person working for the trafficker on the other end, and this was their protocol in case something like this happened. Um, but since the time, there's been a lot of um, training, and we have a great relationship with the Polk County Sheriff Department mm -hmm. um, where we're able to interact with them and be kind of there with them as they do some operations and stuff like that to help immediately with identified victims. Um, and then even the, the 
police force here and the fire department even being willing to engage in this symposium is a big step because yes. we have to address what's going on in the community and so law enforcement plays a major role in that frontline helpers plays a major role in that you go to the house and you guys are called out for EMS services or fire and you go in and you see a jar here with pebbles and an empty one here or what one or two there that might be the counting mechanisms that they count how many people they've slept with for the night you see this kid is now favoring blue and all of a sudden everything is in blue and we're throwing up signs like that that may be the indicator that we're now affiliated with a gang and there may be some concerns there the kid is now using the terminology that's a part of the life uh, that may be an indicator that hey I need to reach out and see what's going on and get a little bit more information and call the right people in Okay, so thank you guys so much for your time tonight. We truly, truly appreciate you. We're going to have Rob come back up and close us out. But please, we would encourage you guys to come back on the 28th to visit with us and get a full day of us talking, if, as if you haven't gotten <laughs> enough. Um, but we will get in depth with some more stuff. So we're going to invite Rob back up for us. Kadian, Marianne, thank you very much. Can you help me thank them for being with us tonight? You said um, you did not want to scare us, but wanted to open our eyes. I know for at least one of us in the room, you did both, and I thank you for that. Um, it's, been, it's been special time with a very tough topic. Some of you may wonder how, how we got um, kind of guided towards this particular topic um, and, and how close it hits to home. Um, we had a, a young lady earlier this year, several months ago, come through our pregnancy program um, who um, told us that um, her pregnancy was a result of traffic, trafficking. We had communications this summer with parents and kids through our summer programs um, with indications of concerns, um, scares of potential um, grooming and targeting. Um, it's right here in our community, and I know we don't want to, to um, believe that, um, but um, we do need to have our eyes wide open. I want to thank again those that helped um, put this together, um, the um, um, Roy from Fire Department, Dave from Police Department, um, the um, local um, representatives from our, our churches, um, Pastor Scott and, and John, um, and the Care Center um, crew. And um, can you help me thank Pete Petrowski for doing the lion's share of the work for putting this together? I do want to remind you of the, um, um, the folders. Again, if you didn't get one coming in, please get one um, going out. Um, there is some very um, in depth and thorough information there. Um, the, through the resource guide and some other um, information on identifying um, the trafficking and some other resources. Again, um, we do have some of our representatives here with the, the booths, the tables that are out in the lobby, is that what we call it here? <laughs> in the lobby. All right. And um, Father Tim, the narthex, will... Um, um, uh, but um, so um, out there, there's some tables and representatives will be headed out there um, for that. Reminder again, October 28th, two weeks from today, 9 to 3, um, lunch provided. Um, please um, consider coming back to that um, and consider inviting um, somebody. This is, this is an awesome opportunity, again, to have our eyes even more wide open um, with our friends from our churches, our, um, our school professionals. Um, our business community and our neighbors and so please encourage someone to come with you um, for that we all need to be in prayer about how we can get more involved and engaged through mentoring through our churches um, parents and grandparents need um, us uh, the village to um, help provide healthy environments through our schools um, that so, um, so much cry out for, um, for mentors, for the students that are there um, that are hurting. Um, pray about the possibilities of fostering. Pray about the possibilities of being involved in um, some of our frontline um, programs like our pregnancy centers. So we should all be in prayer about that. 
And with that in mind, I'm going to invite Brother John Modus um, to come up, um, one of our uh, committee members, deacon at Episcopal Church of the Good Shepherd, to close us out in prayer. Would you please stand as we close in prayer? Thank you again, Katie and, and Mary Ann. I think um, they deserve another thanks for being here with us tonight. Father God, thank you for the gift of this day and this life and this opportunity to live in your world. Lord, thank you that you love us. And in a lot of ways, we have an opportunity to live out that love in caring for your people, your children, but your people. Lord, I'm certain that we were created for such a time as this to live in your world today. And Lord, when those opportunities come, that we see something, Lord, you meant, you meant for us to be there, to perhaps be the one and only person at that moment that could make a difference. Lord, thank you for the training and the opportunities to, to see the things that we have been seeing right in front of us, make us aware. Lord, thank you for your people gathered here and those that will see the video. Lord, that, that they care enough. But Lord, I lift this time. I lift the, the next event and the next training and the opportunities there. Thank you for, for the many, many blessings that you give us. We lift all those we love to you. We trust our lives to you. And as we go from this place, Lord, watch over and protect us. Ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.